Love and deception lie in store for Ren and Stimpy in 25 minutes. First, BBC Two puts the Ferguson theory to the test, very scientific in places. I'm Craig Ferguson, this is the Ferguson theory. As well you might. <laughs> well, the bloody hell have you been? <laughs> I've been running up and down these stairs for an hour. <laughs> then I realised it's not your fault, it's my fault. I forgot to put my clocks back this weekend, you see. I, <laughs> I haven't even had time to adjust my body clock. And as you can see, my body is a very finely tuned machine. <laughs> I don't think we need a laugh on that, actually. I, as you see, my body is a finely tuned machine. I don't like to footer with it. Well, I do, actually. <laughs> Which reminds me, I must get my eyes tested. Now, <laughs> the clocks have gone back. We've changed the time of the clocks. Now, why do we do this? Well, uh, quite a simple reason, really. It helps us get the wrong programme when we're setting our video cassette recorders. <laughs> or VCRs, which is what you say when you haven't got time to say video cassette recorder. Because we love to save time, don't we? We've all got our special time-saving devices. We've got microwave ovens when you haven't got time to cook your tea. Yeah, uh, you've, you've got trouser presses when you haven't got time to iron your trousers. You've got the Breville electric toasted sandwich maker when you haven't got time to pour molten lava on your lips. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so anyway, the clocks have gone back. Now, uh, this, uh, people say, oh, well, the nights are fair drawn in. <laughs> that means it'll get darker at night. <laughs> it doesn't get any darker at night. It just gets dark earlier. I mean, how darker can you get than dark? <laughs> oh, it was as dark as a dark thing. It was as dark as a black cat in a coal cellar wearing a black polo neck jersey and black shoes and drinking Guinness without the wee white bit on it. Aye, that's how dark it was. We just can't help footering with time. We're always footering about with time. If new legislation is passed, we'll all have to adjust to new Euro time, which means everyone will have to go up two hours earlier. Which would be like getting up in the middle of the night. Mind you, if you've been stuffing your greedy wee Eura face with perno and olives and horse meat croissants all day, <laughs> then you're going to have to get up in the middle of the night anyway, aren't you? I think you know what I'm saying. But when you get right down to it, we can't escape from time. You can't escape from time unless you're Doctor Who. Doctor Who? Doctor Who? No, listen, I don't even want to get into this. <laughs> Doctor Who, a, a famous time traveller. And wasn't it strange that no matter where Doctor Who went, or when he went, no matter when he went, the rooms were always made of polystyrene. <laughs> no matter which planet he went to, in whichever universe, he always looked like a disused sand quarry. <laughs> nah, I, I like Doctor Who. I like Doctor Who, right? Because he's got a TARDIS, something which is bigger in the inside than it is in the outside. A bit like Jimmy Boyle. <laughs> <laughs> you want dangerous comedy? It's right here. It's certainly dangerous for me. No, 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 no. No, anyway, I, I, everyone loves Doctor Who. Doctor Who? No, look, I'm, I'm stopping. <laughs> Everyone loves Doctor Who. I, I went to a, a Doctor Who convention in Paisley last week. It was absolutely lovely. Absolutely lovely. The, the Doctor was afforded a typical Paisley welcome as he, as he stepped out of the TARDIS. Three Neds beat him up and demanded his prescription back. <laughs> For God's sake, will somebody put a new battery in that smoke alarm? <laughs> These patches are definitely working, eh? answered machine on just in case I wanted to see who it was but it's you so that's all right <laughs> I love you so that's good I, now look answering machines there's, a, there's an etiquette to telephone answering machines answering machines have been around for years yeah. but some people refuse to recognize the technology and they have to giggle right, no matter what message they're leaving on your machine and it's like 
Oh, oh, good. Oh, no. Oh, no, I hate these things. Oh, I forgot what I was going to say now. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, your entire family have just been wiped out in a car crash. <laughs> Bye. I'm not too sure about telephone answering machines now. If we had telephone calling machines, ah, now that'd be a bit more like it. It could phone your mum on a Sunday. That'd be brilliant. Yeah. Hello, mum. Uh, yes, I've got clean pants on. Yes. How's that? That's good. Sorry about forgetting your birthday again. Yes, bye. Or if you make the, make the calls that you're too frightened to make yourself, so like to your bank manager, they end up, listen, button up. Wise up with the overdraft situation or you die soon, pig, all right? <laughs> The telephone calling machines could phone telephone answering machines and you wouldn't have to speak to each other ever again. <laughs> In fact, if you had a fax machine as well and a home shopping channel on satellite TV, you wouldn't have to get out of your bed ever. <laughs> Except to, you know, get the pizza deliveries. That'd be heaven. No, no, you need to get out of your bed as well to get the stuff you'd ordered on the home shopping channel. Because they sell such fantastic stuff on that, don't they? <laughs> I can't believe I've come this far in life without a Star Trek plate. <laughs> or, or slippers with torches in the toes. <laughs> Can I really go on without a, a cabbage patch doll dressed up as Sherlock Holmes? Who <laughs> invents this crap? And why? Why? Well, I'll tell you, it's, it's marketing men. See, because of the, the growth of consumerism, you see, they have to create markets which previously never existed. For example, uh, the musical commode. <laughs> the ladies of the house will know that you've lifted the seat when they hear the birdie song. <laughs> It's advertising people, you see. It's bloody advertising people. What they do is they create a problem which never existed and then say, if you buy their product, you won't have that problem anymore. Which is true, because you never had the bastard problem in the first place. <laughs> yes. well, let me give you an example. A biological dress, right? They say that if you buy a new biological dress, then you can avoid static cling. <laughs> you know what static cling is? Static cling is a name they've given to that very scary time when you take your shirt out of the tumble dryer and there's a sock stuck to it! Oh, oh my god, Sandy Cling, quick call the laundry, please help! I would next to ask myself, avoid seagulls pecking your eyes out with new Galloway wooden helmets. <laughs> the audacity of the advertising world knows no bounds. They, they'll put anything on the telly and expect you to fall for it. I think, I think they went a wee bit too far with that, that radio and advert that looked like an edition of Newsnight. <laughs> that Jeremy Paxman guy came on and said, Yes, if you buy a new radio on, then your ironing won't smell. <laughs> well, excuse me, Jeremy, you cheeky wee thing. <laughs> My ironing doesn't smell anyway. If you want to make sure something doesn't smell when you iron it, watch that bloody viper! <laughs> Advertising people, is it? Is it? Uh, maybe, maybe I'm being a wee bit too literal, huh? for all the Star Trek plate owners. Maybe I'm being a wee bit too <laughs> existentialist for you. Well, I, I, make no, I make no bones about that. I mean, uh, as the great French philosopher and existentialist Jean-Paul Sartre said, beware when the stain says heart, but the label it says none. <laughs> yes, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre certainly knew a lot about laundry. Ah. Didn't know much about his wife, but he certainly knew a lot about laundry. See, his wife, Simone de Beauvoir, was a very committed feminist. You know, I see, uh, you know, you, you just put like feet on your laundry manifestos and wash your own white rows. Uh, don't come to me for socks or comfort. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, you see, he, he certainly knew about clothes. Uh, he was the man who first initiated the concept of the suit with two pairs of trousers. Uh, an idea which was later expanded by the great Australian philosopher Rolf Harris in the... Uh, Seminal Dada-esque comedy song, Jake the Peck. <laughs> oh, as we're talking about suits, it should probably be Jake off the peg. Deedly little love. Now, <laughs> Rob Harris is famous for inventing the stylophone. Now, it would have to be an Australian that invented the stylophone, wouldn't it? Yeah. Scotsman wouldn't have bothered. Why? Why bother inventing a, a wee thing that makes whiny noises when you can meet half a dozen in any pub in Dundee? <laughs> Two minute game with an automatic lock-in. If you get more than two bits wrong, okay? Right. Oh, no, 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 no,
willfully and callously release into the atmosphere noxious vapors that may lead to the further depletion of the ozone layer. How do you plead? <laughs> that go together like custard and bacon. <laughs> you see what I'm doing here? You see what I'm doing? Do you see? Yes, I, I'm, I'm doing a bit of satire. <laughs> see, I'm talking about British justice. Ah, but wait a minute. Let me put it to you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that there is no such thing as British justice. There's a Scots law where you're innocent until proven guilty, and then there is English law where you're innocent until interviewed by the West Midlands Serious Crime Squad. <laughs> Why do they call them the serious crime squad? So you don't get them mixed up, I suppose, with the not-so-serious crime squad and the can't keep a safe face crime squad. Who turn up at burglaries wearing wee dealy bobbers and stuff. Those glasses with the eyeballs on spring, the whoopee cushions and everything. Take a seat, please, madam. Oh, pardon you! So you've got the, uh, you've got the serious crime squad, the not-so-serious crime squad, and then you've got the Sweeney. <laughs> well, you know why they're called the Sweeney, of course, don't you? you know, it's, uh, it's Cockney rhyming slang, you know. Sweeney Todd, policeman. <laughs> no, 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 I, it must be uh, Sweeney Todd, Mr. Plot, the policeman who was in the flying squad. God, I'm really having to spell out for you people. <laughs> now, here's what I'd like to know, ladies and gentlemen. Here's what I'd like. What has happened to our TV policemen? See, our television policemen. What's happened? These days, they're all chain-smoking psychoanalysts or real ill buffs from, from Oxford or, or, or a Jordan in an Armani suit. <laughs> Who's going to believe that? <laughs> It's all gimmicks with TV policemen these days. It's all gimmicks, it's all that. He's a wild maverick cop that makes sandwiches his way. <laughs> Justice of the peace. <laughs> hey, hey! It was just a rogue pun that suddenly got in there. I don't know how it happened. Yeah, it's all gimmicks with TV cops these days. See, in, in the old days, TV policemen were solid, dependable, reliable, you know. Uh, Zed Cars, Dixon of Doc Green, Skippy. Uh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Skippy, 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 the police kangaroo. Yeah, I remember him. Yeah. You want it? <laughs> Be a cover, you can't come in here without a search wallaby. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> See, they, they were solid, dependable, reliable, the old-fashioned TV policemen. I think that's just because they were in black and white. You see? I, and you can trust someone who's in black and white, can't you? I, I call it the penguin effect. You know, you see, see, penguin, when's the last time a penguin, you know, a penguin's a black and white, so when's the last time a penguin nicked your wallet? <laughs> see, you can trust a penguin, as long as it's not the penguin from Batman, who dresses up as a penguin to avoid suspicion. Very clever. <laughs> because no one suspects penguins, you see? Yeah. See, penguins don't become burglars. You know, granted, they can't carry video recorders or anything, but, <laughs> but they don't. I like penguins. I do. I, I like penguins. Don't know if I'd like my sister marry a penguin, of course. <laughs> Mind you, if I, my sister did marry a penguin, I suppose I wouldn't have to hire a penguin suit, would I? <laughs> well, certainly not for the penguin. But, but uh, knowing penguins the way I do, uh, they'd probably want to get married in the kilt. You know, that contrary wee rascals. Actually, they're bastards when I think about it. I hate penguins. Who do they think they are? With them? How do you do in the laddie does and excuse me, I think you'll find that's my parking space. Man, you, you, can't, you can't blame them for being contrary, can you, penguins? It's not a very glamorous thing to be a penguin, is it? Uh, I mean, you don't get films named after you if you're a penguin. You don't get, you know, would you go and see a film like, you know, Enter the Penguin? Uh, <laughs> he's back, and this time, it's serious. The Penguinator. Uh, uh, just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water. Penguin 2. No, eh? it's not going to happen. So, uh, so yeah, no, I, uh, you won't have that with penguins. Uh, they, they, don't, they don't have films, penguins. They do have books, though, obviously. Uh, uh, that's penguin boots, that's why they make them that size so they can get them under their wee arms when they go to the library. So, so for all that, they're very well read, penguins. So maybe I wouldn't let my sister marry a penguin. After all, the reception would be fun, wouldn't it? Uh, uh, penguins aren't very big drinkers, though, you know, just a couple of snowballs, something like that. Uh, but they are excellent dancers, penguins, especially at the slosh. Ha! Ha! Beautiful Sunday. This is my... That's the reason we decided to form our own vigilante group. That's right, vigilantes. That's right. Aye, there's just far too many nutters in the streets these days. <laughs> Mara, you admit leaving your child home alone. Yes. Didn't you realise he could have choked or been electrocuted? Yeah. So why did you do it? He's Macaulay Culkin. 
<laughs> Where is your holiday destination, sir? Uh, Florida. Do you or your partner have any uh, concealed firearms or ammunition? Uh, uh, no. Right. <laughs> Good evening, lovely wee pet sheep of God. The Reverend Barry Loder here with tonight's sermon. Now, what did Jesus mean when he said in the Bible, suffer the little children to come unto me? Well, you see, the word suffer in the Bible means let. So what Jesus meant was, let the little children come unto me, because he liked children, Jesus. Well, children were decent in biblical times. That was before they had turned into whiny wee jobby bottoms. <laughs> Wear their caps back to front and play Game Boy all the time. You see, nowadays, Satan has children in his power. Yes, Satan, lord of the flies, and person who causes varukas. <laughs> has children in his power, he sends them subliminal messages through computer games. <laughs> computer games is how Satan gets wee children to ensnare themselves in his web. Batman for example. A severed head that goes meaty beep and eats a lot. <laughs> I think it's quite easy to see Satan's influence there. Not so much Pac-Man, more packed man <laughs> As in packed with the devil man. Or what about Nintendo? Sintendo, more like. <laughs> You've probably already noticed that if you see the word Nintendo backwards, you get Odentin. <laughs> An old Hebrew word, meaning be rude to your parents and wipe a snotter in your grand <laughs> But computer games are not the only way that Satan gets children into his power. Uh, what about Timmy Mallet? <laughs> Children's entertainer or high priest of the occult? <laughs> Never let us forget that it was Timmy Mallet that sang She wore an itsy bitsy teeny weeny yellow bone around the And we know why she was wearing it, don't we? because she was about to be sacrificed as an offering to the unholy one! <laughs> now people often say to me, Minister, it is ridiculous to claim that Timmy Mallet is a slave of Beelzebub. Well, perhaps it is, but there's no escaping the fact that he is a very annoying wee gingery planet. <laughs> so, so why don't we just burn them anyway, just in case? I'm nothing if I'm not reasonable. Now, the best way to ensure that your children don't become slaves of Satan is to get them to join a youth movement, but for heaven's sake, Make sure it's not the scouts. <laughs> ging gang gooly 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 what's that ging gang goo duck duck etc. I don't think I need to explain myself any further. <laughs> Satan's attack on the children of this nation is many pronged. He even tries to get them to eat his favourite food of Cocoa Pops. <laughs> You'll notice that Cocoa Pops are advertised on the telly by a cartoon monkey. And when I say a cartoon monkey, I don't mean a bad drawing of Mickey DeLenz, who was in the famous 60s pop group, The Monkeys. All the pop group monkeys were just as bad as Charlie the Cartoon Monkey in the Coco Pop advert, because they had a song called I'm a Believer, and you know what they were believers in, don't you? Ah, that's right. Uh, demonic possession and hovering six feet above your bed, shouting, Oh, you know, the Yes. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Ooh. Yes, no. Lo, it is written in the Bible, lo, it is written in the Bible that there will come a green-eyed monster from the east that will steal away the firstborn of every family. Surely a reference to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> oh! 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 Flashbang Wolf! What a picture! What a picture, what a photograph. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go. Act load off in a battle, smoke trap back. Stab your feet, hanging on the big face drum. I think I've just figured out how Tam manages to drink all that lager and still stay in shape. Oh? Oh. Step aerobics, look. <laughs> How do I love thee? Let me count the ways I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight for the end of being and ideal grace. <laughs> Who wrote that? Mo Johnson? Good guess, but no. 
Well, though Moore's always been a bit of a heartbreaker. Well, it'll certainly break hearts. Charles and £3,000 again, won't it? <laughs> no, that was written by Browning. That's Browning as uh, Elizabeth Barrett and not Browning as in gravy. Although I will admit, <laughs> certainly knew her onions. Now, romantic poets. Men with big floppy hats and flowery shirts. Women walking around in their 90s, crying all the time. No, it's not another Emma Thompson film. No, it's not. <laughs> it's the age of romance and it's coming back. Yeah. Candlelit suppers are all the rage. Or they soon will be when they put VAT on fuel. <laughs> romance. Romance. It's a, it's a word that can split a room in two by its very definition. For, for women, it's an overture to a beautiful symphony. For, for men, it's the guitar intro to Wigwam Bam. <laughs> Love. This very difficult concept. It's hard for people to understand, especially romantically challenged people. People who don't really understand what romance is. I think you know the kind of people I'm talking about, don't you? <laughs> That's right. Scotsman. <laughs> people that have to be reminded that romance exists. People that need St. Valentine's Day. Now, why should you be especially lovey-dovey on St. Valentine's Day? Huh? Who was St. Valentine anyway? Eh? Probably some really poncy monk in the olden days that wore a, a pink habit and made up stupid wee poem. <laughs> roses are red, violets are blue. Uh, now, there's a mistake for a start. Uh, it should be roses are red, violets are violet. <laughs> Obviously, St. Valentine didn't watch the Beach Grove Gardens, but he could, uh, he could have asked his pal, the patron saint of flowers, whoever that is, St. Francis of a Sweet Pea or something like that. <laughs> but he knew it. Did he do it? No, he did not. No, he, he was too busy making up his stupid, his stupid poetry, wasn't he? Roses are red, violets are blue, lovey-dovey, kissy-poo. What a pop! <laughs> All I can say is it must have been pretty easy to get made a saint in those days. <laughs> Sainthood for writing crap poetry. <laughs> if Pam Ayers had been around at that time, she'd have got her own day. Pam Sunday, there you are. <laughs> Pam Ayers, do you remember her? God, what a carry-on that was. Roses is red. <laughs> Roses is red, and so is nasturtium. <laughs> Poems wearing big flowery curtains. <laughs> I think no, it's going. Oh, 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 I'll get that clap for the audience. Never mind. I think. I think St. Valentine's Day should be banned. There you are, I do. I think it should be banned for, for the distress that it causes teenagers. Can you, you must be able to remember that, that time when you're about 13 and you get that Valentine's Day card and you think. You know, oh yes, it could be from Debbie Harry. <laughs> but you know, it's really from your mum. Oh! oh, the horror! And you can always tell. You can always tell. There's wee clues in the poem, like, uh, roses are red, violets are blue, remember to clean behind your ears and put new pants on. <laughs> School kids, though, are, are the people that go in for Valentine's Day in a big way. Well, it, it's a nice way of letting your beloved know that you're learning about spelling and geography. See, because you, you can put the back of the envelope Holland for hope our love lasts and never dies. Or, or Italy for, you know, I truly always love you. Or uh, Zimbabwe for... Uh, <laughs> zebras in my bathroom are barking with envy. That the end of <laughs> or, or something like that. <laughs> I was never really one for St. Valentine's Day at school, though, really. I, I never got any. <laughs> uh, don't patronize me. <laughs> No, I never got any Valentine's, so consequently I never sent any. I, so I had to come up with a, a new, different, kind of subtle way of letting a woman know that I found her attractive. You know, so I'd say something, something along the lines of, there's a party in my pants, baby, and you are guest of honor. <laughs> it's not bad way, isn't it? Can you help him, Pat? Well, he has extensive lung problems which may require surgery. Oh, please, please, you've got to help him. Honestly, he's had no kind of life at all. I've just rescued him from a laboratory where they were testing the effects of tobacco. You mean he's a smoker? Oh, well, that's different. I'm not treating him. <laughs> Join us next week, why don't you, on the Ferguson Theory. Until then, good night! <laughs>
Well, uh, speaking as a taxi driver, uh, what's the highway code? <laughs> Revered as the undisputed genius of 20th century art, Pablo Picasso was a figure of near mythological stature. Now, in a special week of films, documentaries, and dramatic reconstructions, BBC Two unmasks the man and the myths surrounding him. A woman doesn't resist Picasso. Investigated by both the KGB and John Edgar Hoover, Picasso courted controversy wherever he or his work appeared. Although the figures are extremely powerful, it's hard to say how far an art based on hate uh, can be of lasting value. The man, the myths, and the magic. Picasso, the complete picture, starting tomorrow, 7.45, on BBC Two. Privyat fini. Weird being has come to BBC Two now, and I don't mean Ren and Stimpy.